Hello, everybody. Chapter 14. Um, so this is the beginning of the end of the class. So the last four chapters, we're going to learn four different things. It's, it's the same thing we're learning, but just uh, in slightly different. What we're going to look at is, is this, basically. Here's what we're going to do the, the, the rest. How to, whoops, how to maximize profit in, and then we're going to talk about four different types of companies. So the first one we're going to talk about is this thing called perfect competition or a perfectly competitive market. And then we're going to have to talk about how to maximize profit if you own a monopoly. And then we're going to look at monopolistic competition. You don't have to necessarily write this down. This just helps you to know where we're going. And then the final oligopoly type of company we're going to look at is an oligopoly. So we're going to look at four different types of companies. And we're going to look at, ask the question, how do we maximize profit? Meaning, what, how much should I produce and what price should I charge? Right? In these four different types of companies. Okay? And so that's 14, 15, 16, 17, and then, then, the, and then this class is over. So. Whoops. Um, let's. So today we're going to start with competitive markets. Okay. The the questions that you're going to look for the answers to is this. First of all, what on earth is a perfectly competitive market? That's a good question to ask, right? You want to know uh, what kind of company this would look like. We're going to learn about this thing called marginal revenue and how is it related to total revenue and uh, average revenue. Remember, these words, this word marginal keeps popping up a lot in this class. And it's always important whenever you see the word marginal. Um, then, of course, the important piece of this uh, is how does a competitive firm choose the quantity that maximizes profits? Because that's what basically all four of these chapters are about. How do I maximize profits in a different type of company? And then uh, we'll ask when a, a competitive firm, a company that's a competitive firm, shut down in the short run. And should he exit the market in the long run? And we'll talk about that. Like when you should say, hey, I can't make profit at all, and I should just get out of here and go back to school or something. OK? Um, oh, and finally, what does the market supply curve look like in the short run and in the long run? So we'll do that, and that'll be chapter 14. OK, so imagine real quick that three years after graduating, you're running your own business, and so you have a company. And uh, some of the things you have to decide, what, how much you're going to produce, how much Q, right? what the price is going to be that you're going to charge, P, how many workers to hire, all of that kind of thing, right? So what kind of things affect these decisions, right? You kind of have to think. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is maximize profit. But what are the different variables that you can kind of tweak in order to try to maximize, minimize profit? Well, or maximize profit. So first, there's your costs, which remember that was chapter 13 we did last time. Um, then there's how much competition you face, that matters on how much you can charge, right? There's, uh, there's a type of firm that faces a lot of competition. It's called perfectly competitive market. Okay? And so that's what we're going we're gonna to study right now. So let's look at the, the main characteristics of perfect competition. In other words, if you own a company and it has these characteristics, you're going to be in the market structure known as perfect competition. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay? First of all, are there many buyers and many sellers? Okay, many buyers and many sellers. We talked slightly about this way back a long time ago in chapter four when you guys learned supply and demand curves. Um, we talked about the idea that we were always in the perfectly competitive market, right? We were in a competitive market uh, when we had all these ideas. So many buyers and sellers. We're going to have similar product. So if all the sellers are say, selling all the same good, that is uh, perfectly one of the characteristics of perfectly competitive. And finally, firms can freely enter or exit the market. So if you remember back a couple chapters ago when I was imagining there's a swap meet or a flea market, whatever you want to call it, and there's a bunch of guys setting up posts selling sham wows, right? That's kind of looks like a perfectly competitive market, right? There's a lot of sellers. They're all selling the exact same thing. And anyone can come set up shop 
I don't know, buy ShamWiles from wherever the central main distributor is, and then they, they can go ahead and sell these ShamWiles, okay? So that's, that's kind of the idea. Because all the goods are the same, and because there's many different sellers, here's one of the huge keys about perfectly competitive. Each seller is a price taker, meaning you show up at the swap meet, you put your little post up, your little tent in a table, and you just go to sell your ShamWow, you can't really choose the price. You can only sell the ShamWow for the exact same price everybody else is selling the ShamWow for. Because if you charge even one cent higher, they'll just go to another, another seller, right? So even though you're the seller, and I guess theoretically you could ch change the price, you can't really change the price because if you change it even one cent higher, there's a guy right next to you selling the exact same product for one cent cheaper, and all the buyers will go to him. It'll force you to lower your price in order so that you can get buyers as well. Okay? That's known as a price taker. Basically, you just show up, and you're told what price it is. Okay? That's for both buyers and sellers. Okay? Um, and so let's talk about what the revenue of a competitive firm is. Remember, how do you find total revenue? Well, a firm, it sells Q products. It sells each product for P dollars a piece, right? The market price. So the total revenue is just P times Q. Right? Price times quantity. What's the average revenue? Okay, so this is on average how much the firm gets per product. Per product. So you just take the total revenue divided by the Q, and you'll notice in this Interesting case. This is P times Q divided by Q. The Q's cancel. You're just left with P. And this seems kind of no duh at this point, but it'll be more clear in previous chapters. This is not always the case. Basically, on average, if I want to sell one more product, how much does my revenue go up? P dollars. Whatever the price is, right? If I can sell ShamWows for three dollars a piece, and the price is, everybody's selling them for $3 a piece. Then if I go to sell one more ShamWow, what am I going to get? I'm going to get three more dollars, whatever P is, the market price. Okay. Now, let's talk about marginal revenue. Now, marginal revenue is the amount that you get from selling one more ShamWow. I think it might have been a little bit unclear here. Average revenue. If I am selling 10 ShamWows on average, how much am I getting per ShamWow? I'm getting just the market price. That's the average revenue. Marginal revenue. If I sell one more ShamWow, one more product, how much additional do I get? That's, 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 uh, that's the marginal revenue. And it turns out that... Uh, well, it turns out that I'll let you figure this out, actually. So um, let's imagine we're in a perfectly competitive market, OK? So I can sell, remember, right now, we're, we're going to be sellers. For the next four chapters, we're going to be the firms, the factories. So I'm going to sell either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 products. The price that I can sell each one for is $10. Why? Because I don't get to make the, the, the price. Even though I'm the seller, I don't get to choose. Because there's so many other sellers, they're selling the exact same thing as me. If I try to change the price and make it even one cent more, the buyers are just going to go somewhere else. So I'm kind of handicapped. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't change the price. Okay? So I want you to go ahead and fill in the total revenue. So this is the total amount that they get. This is kind of easy, right? If I sell zero, I'm selling them for $10 a piece. How much do I get? Well, I get zero dollars, right? What's my average revenue? Well, that doesn't make sense because uh, you can't divide anything by zero. And then what's my marginal revenue? Well, I look at the change in total revenue from here to here, and that'll give me my marginal revenue. Okay, so go ahead and fill that out and see what you get. Okay, I'll give you these the answers. So don't forget total revenue is just price times quantity. So I just go price times quantity. I'm selling zero of them, even I could sell them for ten dollars a piece, it's zero dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, thirty dollars, forty dollars, fifty dollars. Okay. Average revenue. Average revenue, just like average cost, actually, it's got the same kind of idea. 
I'm selling blank number of them, I'm selling Q products. On average, how much did consumers pay me for all these past ones? On average, how much did they pay me? Well, you'll just look. They paid me $20 total and I sell two of them, so on average, how much did they pay me? 10 bucks, right? I'm selling 30 of them, or I'm selling them for $30. And they, they bought three of them on average, how much did they pay me? $10. It's $10 all the way down, right? We know that. In a perfectly competitive firm, average revenue is always equal to the market price, P, okay? Now, let's look at marginal revenue. How do I look at marginal revenue? Well, I'm currently selling zero, and I want to go sell one. What's the change in the total amount of money I have from zero to 10? Well, marginal revenue is 10. Uh, to go from one to two, it goes from 10 to 20. How much did my income increase? $10. It just so happens the marginal revenue at every point is also P, right? So the average revenue is the market price. The marginal revenue is also the market price at this point, OK? So as you can see, marginal revenue is equal to P. This is only true for this kind of a firm, perfect competition. This little guy right here is not true for the rest of these. Right? It seems kind of like a no-duh thing. You're like, of course. <laughs> If I can only sell them for P dollars and I sell one more, of course I'm going to get P dollars for it, right? It seems kind of no doubt. I'll, I'll explain to you why it's going to be different, but that'll be in the next chapters. Okay. So the idea here is that marginal revenue equals P for a competitive firm. Why is that important? Because remember, back in the cost chapter, I said you can make profit maximization an easy question. You just say, all right, I'm making 10 tacos. I'm going to make an 11th taco. What's my marginal cost? Meaning, how much do I have to pay to make taco number 11? And then I compare that to what? My marginal revenue, which is how much extra dollars do I get for making taco number 11? Guess what? If I get more dollars for making the taco than it costs me to make the taco, should I make it? Yes. Right? That's how I do profit maximization. Right? If I got more money coming in than money going out for taco number 11, I should make taco number 11. Right? And then when I get to number 11, what do I do? I say, well, should I make number 12? <laughs> right? And then I just look. What's the money coming in? What's the money going out? The money coming in from taco number 12, that's marginal revenue. And it's always equal to the price. So it's kind of easy. It's kind of nice, whatever the market price is. Um, the marginal cost, though, however much it costs me to make that next taco, that's the one that has the kind of Nike swoosh looking shape, and that one's a little bit more difficult. Okay. okay, so the key here, why is this always true? Well, it's because a competitive firm can keep increasing its output without affecting the market price. Normally, Why is this crazy to think about? Well, what did I just, just draw right here? A demand curve. Now the demand curve tells me what? If I am here at quantity one and I want to sell more, let's say I want to sell quantity two, Am I able to do it at the same price? No, right? There was a price here, but in order to sell more, I had to make all my products cheaper so that more people would buy them, right? This is what you know about economics. If you want to sell more, the price has got to go down. Yes? This is very weird, if you've been paying attention in this class. I can sell as much as I want, and the price doesn't change. You see that? It's totally different than this guy right here. Now, the idea is, how many people, do you remember like in the quantities in order to have a smooth demand curve? I need like, I need like in the thousands, right, of quantities here. We're going to assume that these little tiny competitive firms are just super small. So they're selling like six products or eight products or something like that, right? And so they're going to go from here to like here because it's so small. Does that make sense? So they're so small, they move just a little tiny bit, and so the, actually the price doesn't really change. Does that make sense on what we're assuming? So it's very important you understand how we get to this point. It's just because they're just so small, and there's like a whole bunch of people 
that are firms that are selling. So each individual firm, if he chooses to sell one or two more, like he's not going to be able to affect the price just because he's really small. And there's thousands and thousands of people selling. Okay? So that's how both of these things can be true at the same time. Right? Otherwise, they look like it's a contradiction. Okay. So because that I can change Q and P doesn't change, so not this, right? Every time I make more, one more product, how much marginal revenue do I get for that product? Meaning, if I make one more, how much more revenue do I get? That's marginal revenue. Well, I'm just always going to get whatever the market price is, okay? Whatever the P is. Okay. And so this is true only for firms in competitive markets. Only for firms in competitive markets. But it makes our math so much easier because I don't ever have to calculate marginal revenue. I just know it can be P, price. Right? I don't ever have to calculate marginal revenue. I still am going to have to figure out marginal cost, right? Because that's the other half of the profit maximization. If I can sell it more than it costs me to make it. But the marginal revenue is equal to price. OK. So how do I profit max? Well, a competitive firm doesn't get to choose the price, right? So really, there's only one thing that a competitive firm can choose when he's trying to maximize profit, his quantity, right? Um, why don't they get to choose the price? Because they just show up at the market and they just have to sell the price that everybody else is selling for. Okay. So let's go ahead and think at the margin. This is what I've been doing all the time with my little one step forward idea, right? We think at the margin. I'm, at, I'm selling 10 tacos. What happens if I sell 11 tacos? What happens? Well, if I increase quantity by one unit, if I sell one more taco, what happens? I get MR, marginal revenue, more dollars, right? That's what marginal revenue means. If I sell one more taco, how much money do I get? At the same time, though, if I sell one more taco, it costs me money. I have to pay workers. I have to buy tortillas. I have to buy carne asada. I have to shred up lettuce, whatever. Okay? That's marginal cost if I sell one more taco. So if marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, meaning I get more money from making the taco than it costs me to make the taco, well, then I should go ahead and make that taco, and it'll make my profit go up. This is simple, right? Profit maximization boils down to one simple truth. If I get more for making this taco than I, than I have to pay in costs, I should make it. However, if marginal revenue is less than marginal cost, right, should I make that taco? No. And furthermore, I should actually probably make even fewer tacos. OK? Or any, whatever. Maybe it's not tacos. I, it, maybe it's just any Q. I should just make less output. Okay. So let's uh, put back up the chart that we did in the, in the group exercise, except for I'm going to put in more columns, OK? So this was the total revenue when I got, because remember, what was the market price? It was just $10 at every time, right? So every time I sell a product, I get $10. So in total, I get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. My marginal revenue, remember, each time is $10. So the marginals, as you can see, go halfway in between, right? So the marginal costs go halfway in between. OK. And now I'm going to give you this column. This is just made up of costs. OK, I'm going to give you this. 5, 9, 15, 23, 33, 45, okay? Uh, just totally made up. I just made those up. It's a total cost curve, and it goes up, right? So if I make three, my total cost, all of my fixed costs plus variable costs and everything is $23. If I make four, all of my total costs goes up to 33. If I make five, my total cost for my whole factory go up to 45, okay? So uh, let's look at the marginal costs. How do I do that? Well, I'm making 0, and now I want to make 1. So how much additional cost is it costing me as the factory? It's costing me 4 extra dollars to make that guy. Right? It's costing me, from 9 to 15, 6 extra dollars to make this guy. 
It's costing me eight extra dollars to make this guy. It's costing me 10 extra dollars to go to number four. And finally, to go to number five, say it's costing me 12 extra dollars. So do you see how the marginal cost is increasing? Remember last chapter, we learned about as you increase quantity, the marginal cost starts taking off, right? You can see that right here. Now, let's just look at the information we have on here. And we actually have enough information to know what quantity I should make. Check this out. Hey, should I make taco number one? Well, I can sell it for $10, and it only costs me $4. So yeah, I should make it, right? Should I make taco number two? I, remember, I'm just thinking on the margin, just one at a time. It's super simple. Should I make number two? Well, to go from one to two, it, I get $10, because it's the market price. It only cost me $6 to make it. Well, yeah, I should, because then I, I'm going, making money here, right? Um, to go from two to three, $10 that I get for revenue, it only cost me $8 to make it, right? So yeah, I should do that, right? Now, from three to four, should I make three to four? Well, here, it cost me $10, and it cost me $10, and I get $10, so I'm like indifferent. Number four, it, it doesn't matter to me. I could make it, I might not make it, right? It doesn't matter to me. But certainly, should I make number five? No, it costs me more than the marginal revenues, right? So the firm's decision in a perfectly competitive marketplace is always just very simple. Should I, how much Q should I make, right? And at this point, we know that the guy should make between three, three or four, right? Three or four, he should make. And um, the thing we don't know yet at this point is how much actual profit did the firm make, right? We haven't calculated that yet. But we do know that if he makes somewhere between three and four, He's maximizing the total profit he could possibly make. We don't know what that number is on how much profit he actually made, but we do know that it's somehow maximized. Okay? How do we figure out the actual profit? Well, we just go um, total revenue minus total cost. So at this point, he's making negative five dollars. He doesn't want to be here, right? Now he's making a dollar profit. Now he's making five dollars profit. His total profit's going up, right? Here's making seven dollars profit. He's making seven dollars profit, and here he's back down to five dollars profit, right? So, just as we predicted, where is he going to want to be? Neither three or four. Does that make sense? Now, finally, I know kind of both sides of the story. I know how much Q he should make, which is either three or four. And then when he's making that, how much actual, what's his take home profit at the end of the day? Okay. Now, if I look at, if I, if I just look at the marginal profit or the change in profit, I can see that he makes six extra dollars from making this first one. He makes four extra dollars from making the second one. He makes two extra dollars from making the third one. He makes zero extra dollars in profit from making the fourth one. So he's like, eh, I'll make three, I'll make four. It doesn't really matter. I get the same amount of profit either way. right? But certainly he doesn't want to make five because then his profit starts going down by two dollars. You see where this negative two is coming from? He was making seven and then he made five dollars in profit. So what's the change? Negative two. Okay? You definitely don't want to be on that where you're hurting your profits. Okay? All right. So, anytime you have marginal revenue, which is greater than marginal cost, let's make more Q. Let's make it. Right? If you have marginal revenue less than marginal cost, don't make that Q. Reduce the Q. Okay? So, really, if you think about it, profit maximization is a really simple compare marginal revenue and marginal cost. Okay? And that is going to be the foundation for, well, I don't have them up here anymore, but all the next chapters, all you're going to do is compare marginal revenue to marginal cost. So get very used to doing that, because that's basically what, what, uh, you, what you do for every single chapter. Okay, so let's look at, put the marginal cost on here. Okay, so I have my costs, I have my quantity, I have my marginal cost curve. You know a lot of times, it's drawn with a little swoosh here, you know, in the front. We're just going to omit the little swoosh part on the bottom just to make it easier because what we're really focused on is the increasing part of the marginal cost curve. So if price is at P1 in the market, if price is at P1 in the market, that means that if I sell another product, I'm going to get how much? 
P1 dollars, so, right? So that means my marginal revenue is equal to P1. That's what I've got here, right? Marginal revenue is equal to P1, okay? Now think this through. Should I make this many quantity? Well, marginal revenue bigger than marginal cost. Yeah, I should make it. I should make that one and I should go to the next one. Now should I make this one? Yeah, because marginal revenue is still more than marginal cost. I should make all the way up to this guy right here, right? Does that make sense to everybody? If I were to make more than that, look, marginal cost is killing me. It's higher than my marginal revenue. I'm losing money, right? So I need to make at this point right here. So at QA, what should I do when marginal cost is less than marginal revenue? Increase production, right? Increase quantity. If, however, I'm at quantity B, marginal revenue above my margin excuse me, marginal cost is above my marginal revenue. I'm losing money here. I need to reduce production, okay? And I get to this place, we'll call it Q1, where the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue. Okay, so if you're a perfectly competitive firm, this is easy. You just take your marginal cost curve, you look at how much you can sell it for on the open market, that's the P, right, because you don't get to change it because you're just a perfectly competitive firm, P, and you just go, whatever the P is, you just go until it hits the marginal cost curve and then you go down. And that's how much quantity you should make to maximize your profit. Okay. Um, if you make any other quantity than where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, it's, that would lower profit. Please circle this, highlight this, whatever you want to do, because this thing is true for all four different types of markets, okay? Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That is always the profit maximizing condition, okay? So if I, from here on out, ask you, what is the profit maximizing condition? You're always going to say, well, it's the place where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Okay, that is always a profit maximizing condition. There you go. Marginal revenue, marginal cost at the profit maximizing quantity. Okay. What happens if you change the price to P2? What happens if you change the price to P2? Is the firm, should the firm make a different quantity? How can you find the quantity for the profit maximizing for this firm? now that the price raised to P2, right? I just look at where the marginal revenue crosses or where the price crosses with the marginal cost, right? So now I'm here. So now this guy, he shouldn't make Q1 anymore. He should increase production to Q2, right? If the price rises, now again, don't forget, I am a firm but I don't have control over setting the price. Why? Because I just show up to the swap meet and I just look around and see what everybody else is selling. I can't change the price of my product. But let's say one day I show up and I just notice everybody else is selling them for more now, right? That's what I mean by the price goes up. It's not like I, as a firm, decided to sell it for more. Because I can't make the decision. I'm a price taker. I cannot make the decision to change my price. Okay? But if I just happen to see that, hey, ShamWow's got more popular, and now everybody's selling them for more expensive, so I will too, that's also going to mean not only will I sell them for more expensive, I will sell more of them. Okay? Higher quantity. Okay. So the marginal cost curve determines the firm's quantity at any price. All I need to know for a perfectly competitive firm is the marginal cost curve. That's all I need to know if I want to know the, the profit maximizing quantity. Now, if I want, there, I'm going to need the other cost curves if I want to know other stuff. But if all I'm saying is how much Q should I make, all I need is a marginal cost curve. I just plug in the price and I just and I get a quantity from it. Now, let me ask you something. What did I just draw right here? Supply curve. What does supply curve tell me? Do you remember? The amount that firms are willing to sell at any price, right? So guess what? If price is P1, 
What does the supply curve tell me? The firm wants to sell Q1. Yeah? If the price is P2, the firm wants to sell Q2. Right? That looks a whole lot like this, doesn't it? Well, it just so happens that the marginal cost curve is the firm's supply curve. It is. That's actually where this comes from. Does that make sense? The marginal cost curve is the firm's supply curve. So I know I taught you the, the supply curve without really teaching you where it comes from, but now you know. All it is is the firm's marginal cost curve because it tells you the exact same thing, you see? Kind of cool, right? I think it's cool. Anyway. So marginal cost curve is the firm supply curve. And then if I want to see how much the whole entire marketplace is, gonna, is going to sell, well, remember, like I did in chapter four, I just add up all the supplies of all the individual companies, and I can get the whole marketplace. Okay. All right. Let's talk about shutdown versus exit. Um, let me define them first. So shutdown is a short run concept. So remember, short run. What's the difference between short run and long run? Short run, long run. Who remembers what's the difference between short run and long run? Exactly. In the long run, everything's a variable cost. In the short run, we still got fixed costs, right? So shutdown, we're talking about in the short run, which means we're talking about when I still have a fixed cost of, of like rent, a rental rate for my factory or something like that. Okay. Basically, what this means, the easy way to think about it, is to take your factory and to turn it to zero, zero output. That's all it means. It means to turn your factory off. Okay. If I still have a factory, but I turn it to off, do I have to pay anything? I don't have to pay any variable costs, but I do have to pay something. What do I have to pay? Fixed costs, the rental rate on my factory, okay? So it's really crucial you understand. Shutdown just means turning it to off, but I still have to pay for my factory. Now, on the, on the other hand, exit means this is a long run idea, right? So in the long run, I can take my factory that's shut down, that's turned to zero, and I can eventually sell it. Does that make sense? I can eventually get rid of it. Okay? And that's called exit. All right? And so, do I have any costs if I exit? Now I finally don't have any cost, any cost. Okay? Shutdown. All I do is I take my factory, I turn it to zero, but I still have to pay for the factory because it's a fixed cost, right? But in the long run, eventually, I can sell my factory, and then I'll have no costs, right? And then I'll have nothing, and that's called exiting. Okay, so very big difference between the two. Okay, so right, if you shut down in the short run, if you shut down, you still have to pay the fixed costs, right? If you exit, you don't have to pay any costs because you can finally get rid of your factory now. So. Let's think about when would a firm want to shut down? That means turn its factory to zero, right? It still has to pay for its factory. When would it want to do that? Well, let's think about it. What do you get? If you shut down your factory, you turn it to zero, what does that cost you? You lose all of the revenue that you were getting, right? If, but, but what you do get from shutting down, you don't have to pay your variable costs anymore, right? You don't have to pay your variable costs. You still have to pay the fixed costs, but you don't have to pay the variable costs. So that's a good thing. Yay, if you turn, if you turn out your, your factory off, you don't get total revenue, but you get, do get variable costs. So you should shut down. If your total revenue is less than your variable costs, you should shut down. If your total revenue is less than your variable costs, you should shut down. I mean, turn your factory to zero. Even though you're still going to end up having to pay a fixed cost, it's better to turn your factory to zero if you have this guy. Now, if you divide both sides by Q, right? Total revenue divided by Q, variable cost divided by Q. Well, do you, anybody remember what total revenue divided by Q is going to be equal to? Total revenue is P times Q. So divided by Q, the Q's cancel. This is just going to be P. 
Who remembers what this is? Variable cost divided by Q from last chapter? That's called average variable cost, right? So if price is less than the average variable cost, you should shut down. If price is less than your average variable cost, it's shut down. So we're going to call this the shutdown rule. The shutdown rule. If you just so happen to find yourself in a place where the market price for your product is less than your variable costs, your average variable cost for the product, you should not make it. Okay? Now, why does that make sense? Go back to our taco shop example. What's our variable costs? Our variable costs are like our, our tortilla and the carne asada and the lettuce and some salsa. Let's just say that's our variable cost, right? Now, if I can't even sell that taco, if the price that I sell the taco for is less than how much it costs me for the tortilla and the meat and the, and the salsa, then I shouldn't make it at all, right? I'm not even going to cover my costs of the tortilla and the, and the meat itself, right? I'm not even going to cover the cost of the tortilla, of the taco, by selling it on the market price, uh, out of the market, right? That's what this is telling me here. The price is less than my average variable cost. Well, clearly, I should not make any tacos then. Because <laughs> every taco I make, I'm actually going to lose money on the tacos. Does that make sense? So I should sell none of them. OK. So let's uh, throw the cost curves back up there. So I've got marginal cost, average total cost, average mm -hmm. variable cost. Right? You remember that from last chapter? Bonus, it's not important right now, but marginal cost crosses both of these curves at the minimum point. Right? OK, so if you have the price above ABC, remember the shutdown rule. The shutdown rule says when price is below ABC, shut down. But when price is above ABC, you should produce the quantity. You should produce. Right? So down here, my shutdown rule comes into effect. Right? My shutdown rule comes into effect. Up here, I should produce. Exactly how much should I produce? Well, we know. We just take whatever the price is, run it into the marginal cost, and then we come down. That makes sense? OK. So strictly speaking, the firm supply curve goes to 0 when it's, when it's underneath the ABC. Because right? that's the, shut, the shutdown rule takes into effect. It says you can't even get enough money to cover the cost of the tortilla and the meat and stuff in your taco. So you should make zero. Okay. So in all honesty, the short run supply curve, remember I told you the supply curve is the marginal cost curve? That was almost right. The, the supply curve is the marginal cost curve only when it's above the ABC. Because under the ABC, maybe we're making zero. Right? We're shutting down. Okay. So the supply curve is the portion of the marginal cost curve that is above the ABC curve. Okay. So this little red guy is the firm supply curve. Right. The second you start to tell the firm, hey, you can only sell your product for down here below this price down here, the firm's like, no, I can't even make it. I can't even do it, right? Up here, he's going to still sell, and he'll sell at the at the, at the uh, marginal cost curve. All right. Let's talk about irrelevance of sunk costs. So um, a sunk cost, the definition, is a cost that you've already paid and you can't get back, or that you have to pay. Okay. Out of the different costs that you've learned, like variable costs, fixed costs, etc. Which one of them? Which one of them is a sunk cost? Fixed cost is sunk cost, right? You have to pay it no matter what, so it's sunk, right? Um, we don't. Here's the kind of crazy thing: if I have to pay them any way I look at it, then I don't incorporate that into the decision making process, right? It shouldn't matter. Because it doesn't matter whether I make Q equals 0 or Q, make Q equals 1,000, I still have to pay the fixed cost. So if I'm trying to figure out how much Q to make, guess what I'm not going to think about? The fixed cost, because I have to pay it anyway. All right. 
So the firm pays its fixed cost whether it produces or shuts down. So therefore, the fixed cost does not even matter at all in the decision making process in deciding how much Q to make right? for the shutdown decision. Um, and that's why the last graph that I showed you that the only thing that mattered was the marginal cost if it was above the ABC. We didn't even talk about fixed costs, right? Because we were talking about the ABC. We're not even talking about fixed costs. Okay. All right, does that, so does that make sense about shutting down? When should the firm turn it to off? Now, there's another question. It's very related, but it's different. It says this. Should I exit? Meaning, should I put my factory up for sale? And should I sell it? And it's going to take me a year or so to sell. I don't know how long it's going to take. It's going to take me a long time to sell, right? But should I go ahead and sell it and never be in the taco business anymore, right? That's what, that's what exiting means, OK? So let's ask when we should do it. So what happens? If I get out of the market and I, and I, and I leave the taco business forever, what do, I, what do I lose? I give up my revenue. I give up how much I was going to get for selling tacos, right? But what do I gain? Well, it's nice. I don't have to pay any costs, right? So what do I get to get rid of? All of my costs now. Now it's total costs. Last time we did this for shutdown, remember, you still had to pay the fixed costs. So the only thing that you got out of, got rid of, was variable costs. Now, though, I get rid of every type of cost, total cost. So basically, I should get rid of my factory and exit the industry forever if the amount I'm making is less than my total costs. The amount I'm making is less than my total costs. Okay, that makes sense. Divide both sides by Q. Remember, total revenue divided by Q, that's price. Total cost divided by Q is average total cost. So now I've written the firm's exit rule. This is not the shutdown rule, that was the other thing, right? Shutdown when I turn it to off. This is the exit rule, meaning I get rid of my factory and I sell it and I'm out of the thing forever. I exit when price is less than average total cost. Price is less than average total cost. Okay, that's the exit rule. All right, so on the flip side, this is very related to the exit rule, is when should I start selling, right? When should I come into the taco industry and start selling tacos? Okay, does that make sense? We're going to call that the entry condition, right? When should someone come in and enter and, and sell tacos, okay? So this is pretty simple. If I can make more revenue, then it's going to cost me, I'm going to start selling tacos. So divide both sides by Q and again, and I P is greater than ATC. So this is the entry, the entry rule, which is the exact opposite of the exit rule, right? What's the exit rule? When price is less than average total cost, get out of there, right? When price is greater than average total cost, yes, come sell. That makes sense? The entry and the exit rule. And again, these are long run decisions. Why? Because it takes me a long time to build a taco shop, right? And, and it takes me a long time to sell my taco shop. These are fixed costs. This goes very slow. I'm talking about like a year out there, right? I'm not talking about, oh, tomorrow what should I do? That's when I look at the shutdown rule, right? But what I'm talking about, oh, over the next year, a year from now what should I do? Then that's when the entry and the exit rules come into come into account, right? Because a firm can't just start selling tacos tomorrow, right? It takes a long time to get a taco business going or any sort of business going, okay? So let's look at uh, the supply curve again. This time I'm going to write the long run average total cost. Why long run average total cost? Because remember, that the entry and exit rules are long run ideas. We can, we can only enter and exit in the long run. So I should look at my long run average total cost curve. So the firm's long run supply curve is the portion of the marginal cost curve above the average total cost curve. 
This is the long run supply. Remember earlier, well, I'll let you write that down first. In the long run, how much is a firm going to make? Well, how much quantity is the firm going to make? If the price is up here, they're going to run into their marginal cost curve and come up with a quantity. right? But in the long run, if the price is below the long run average total cost curve, it means they're losing money. And they're not going to produce here. They're going to produce 0. right? So the point would actually be the curve would look like They won't actually produce if it's under the long run average total cost curve. In the long run. OK. So let's look at this firm. And you tell me, how much profit is this guy making? How much profit is this guy making? So first thing you need to do is you need to tell me how much, well, first of all, is he doing the shutdown rule or not? Right? Is he making zero or is he producing? If he is producing, what Q is he producing? Kind of out there. <laughs> it's written on there. And if he's making a Q, how much profit is he making? Give me a number of dollars. Okay? I'll let you guys look at that for about two minutes. Okay. Let's look at this guy. So he's a competitive firm means he doesn't get to choose the price. He just shows up to the marketplace and somebody tells him how much, right? And he showed up and they're like, hey, you can sell your products here for $10. So he's like, oh, $10. First question, is it above the, the shutdown rule? Right. What's the shutdown rule, actually? Who remembers the shutdown rule? It's when price is greater than the AVC, right? So is price greater than AVC here? Kind of a trick question. There's no AVC on here. But what do I know? The AVC always has to be what? At least under the ATC, right? So is price greater than AVC here? Yes. So for sure, it's not going to shut down, right? So no. It's not going to shut down. It's going to produce. Next, since I know it's going to produce, how much will it produce? Well, it's easy. I just take whatever the market price is, and I run it into the marginal cost curve, and then I go down. And how, much, how many uh, products is this guy going to make? 50. Very good. He's going to sell 50 of them. Now, let's kind of do this in our brain. How much total revenue is he going to get? I'm not talking profit here. How much total revenue is he going to get? Meaning, how many dollars are, is the public going to spend on his goods? How many total dollars will people write him checks for or give him cash for? 500. He's selling 50 of them, and he's getting 10 bucks per each one, so he's getting 500 total dollars. But is that his total profit? No, because it's costing him something to make these. How much is it costing him? Well, let's go down. Boom. I know it's costing him $6 on average. This is, it doesn't mean every single one of them is costing as much as. On average, it's costing him $6, right? So he's making 50 of them times $6. That's $300, right? So he's getting $500, but it's costing him $300. So what's his profit? $200, OK? And graphically, OK, so he's getting $4 profit per unit. There's 50 of, these, uh, 50 of them being made. So graphically, it's the area of this rectangle right here. Do you see that? So I might ask you this on a test. I say, like, what area represents the firm's profit. And you have to see, it's this amount that goes from his revenue down to his costs, and then includes all the quantity. Okay. If I were to ask you what area represents his costs, well, you would draw in this rectangle down here. This area represents his costs down here. But this area is his profit. Okay. And it's $200, as you guys said. Question. 
Okay. Now, uh, real quick, let's look at this one. This guy, is he doing as well as the other firm? No. What's the problem with this guy? The price is below his ATC. That means he's losing some money here. But now the question is, how much is he losing? How much is he losing is the question we ask. Okay. So in order to do that, we say, how much is he making? Actually, the first thing we need to do is this. Shutdown rule. Is the firm going to make anything at all? Right? So I got to ask if the price is above ABC. Luckily, it gives me a little information right here, right? It says, let's just assume the ABC is less than 3. So it means assume the ABC is way down here somewhere, OK? So in other words, that means do I do the shutdown? No, still no shutdown, still no shutdown, OK? Because that is talking about in the, in the short run, OK? Still no shutdown. So what is he going to make? Take the price, run it into the marginal cost curve, go down, he makes 30 of them. Okay? So this is weird. This is still the profit maximization point. <laughs> it's just the profit is a negative number, right? This is like the best he could possibly do. Even though he's still losing money, this is the best he could still possibly do. Does that make sense? All right. And how much is he losing? What's his loss? Can you guys look at that and see what his loss is? Okay, you're close. It should be 60, right? He's losing $2 per unit, right? And how many is he selling? 30. Okay. So his loss is $2 a unit times 30 is 60. Whoops. Now I have a real quick question to ask you. And then we'll take a break. Why on earth is he still producing? He's losing money. Why is he still producing? Anybody know? It has to do with this idea of the fixed cost, right? If he turns his factory to zero, he still has to pay a fixed cost, right? So if I look at this and I can say he's still producing and he's losing 60 bucks, it must mean that if he were to turn his factory all the way off and he would just have to pay his fixed cost, his fixed cost must be even worse than this. Does that make sense? So what he's doing is he's like, I like I know I'm losing money here, but at least I can pay off a little bit of my fixed cost by making some products, right? If I were to turn my factory to zero, I still have to pay rent on my factory for the rest of this year, right? I still have to pay rent on my factory. If I were to turn it off, I'm going to be doing even worse than $60 because of my fixed cost. Okay. Now, in the long run, what's this guy going to do? Is he going to stay in the business? No. He's going to do that thing we call exit in the long run. All right? So this is a really interesting point. right? He's going to produce in the short run, and he's going to get out of the business called exit in the long run. All right. Uh, so we've looked a little bit about the supply, and I know that the supply is always tied to the price, right? For any individual firm, how much will he, will he supply? Well, I just take the market price, the price that the market tells the firm, I run into his marginal cost curve, and then I come down to quantity, okay? Now let's think about how, how does that change for the entire market? Well, first of all, let's assume that everybody has the exact same cost curve. Okay, both the current firms and the potential people who are going to come in and open up new firms, right? So this is important because remember the the firms only produce if their price is above the associated cost curve, right? So everybody's going to have the same ATC curve. Um, furthermore, the ATC and the AVC curves don't change as other firms join. Okay. Uh, and then the number of firms in the market is going to be fixed in the short run. Remember, uh, it let's take the taco shop example. You can't just start selling tacos tomorrow, right? In the short run, only the existing taco firms can sell tacos. But 
in the long run, because anyone can come in and, and set up a taco shop, you just you know have to buy a taco stand and you know learn how to make tacos, whatever those fixed costs are. Uh, you can you can enter, okay? But that's a long run idea, okay? So given that all that's true, then the short run market supply curve will look like this. As long as price is above the ABC, right? As long as price is above average variable cost. And that means that each firm won't shut down, right? Because if price is less than AVC, shutdown rule, right? Price is less than AVC, shutdown rule. The firms are going to turn their factories down to zero, okay? But as long as it's above here, each firm will produce its profit maximizing quantity. And what's the profit max condition? Marginal revenue equals marginal cost, of course, okay? And so we just add up the sum of the quantities by all the individual baby firms, the smaller firms, and I mean, they're just individual firms. They're not small. And, uh, and then I get to the market quantity. OK. So here's what it looks like. I have my one firm. And I know this guy. If, if the market tells him the price is here, that's under his ABC, he's going to produce zero. right? But if I tell him up here, then he's going to produce. right? So. Uh, if there's a thousand identical firms, all just like this firm, remember, because in a competitive firm, each of these firms are really tiny, but there's like thousands of the sellers of the factories. That's kind of one of just the things that we say that's a characteristic of perfect competition. So at P1, this is the lowest minimum price he's willing to sell products at, right? He's the lowest minimum price he's willing to sell products at. Anything lower, he's not going to sell. So at P1's the lowest minimum price he's willing to sell at, let's suppose that that's 10. Let's just make it up. Okay? Which means that if there's a thousand identical taco shops and each taco shop is selling 10 tacos, how many tacos are being sold in the entire place? 10,000. Okay? But let's say the price goes up a little bit to P2. What do I know? Well, each individual firm, are they still going to only sell 10? No. How do I determine the quantity that each firm is going to sell? I take the price, I run it into the marginal cost curve, and I come down and I get 20. Right? And that makes sense. If you tell the firms, hey, you can now, now sell your tacos for more, they're going to be like, yeah, we will. And we'll sell more tacos too. Right? Um, and so if each firm is selling 20 tacos and there's 1,000 of them, there's now 20,000. Right? What happens if the price goes up again? Same thing, right? They make more, each individual firm makes more, and the whole marketplace makes more. Okay. So I draw my market supply curve like so. My market supply curve. And so when I am doing... The typical normal, like, you know, supply curve, demand curve, crossing, what's the market price, whole spiel that, that's about all we do in economics when I'm doing that. This guy right here, the supply curve, is this right here. Okay? The lowest point it stops at happens to be the bottom of the AVC curve. Everybody see that? It doesn't ever go below whatever the AVC curve is, okay? But other than that, then it just goes up according to what all the individual firms' marginal cost curves are, okay? So in the long run, entry and exit. So don't forget, number characteristic number three of a perfectly competitive firm is that there's free entry and exit, meaning people can come in, people can come out. Anyone can set up a taco shop or anyone can close up shop, right? This is not like, uh, I don't know, opening a nuclear power plant, <laughs> right? I would definitely say there are barriers. There's no free entry and exit in nuclear power shop, nuclear power station. Me and you can't just go decide to open a nuclear power station, right? We have to get all kinds of government approval and all kinds of stuff. But me and you could definitely decide to open a taco shop, right? 
Uh, don't forget, we can't open one in the short run because it takes a long time to get all of the, you know, to build a factory or learn how to make tacos or whatever your fixed costs are. It takes a long time, okay? So in the long run, we can make, we can open a taco shop, okay? And that means the number of firms can change uh, due to entry and exit. So if the existing firms, the existing taco shops today are making a lot of profit, what do you think is going to happen? More taco shops, right? More people are going to come in. That's going to mean that new firms enter. New firms enter. So what does that, what does that happen? What happens to this guy right here? OK, let's see what happens. So this is the whole market. This is the whole market. So this is the whole market supply, and this is the whole market demand. If all of a sudden a bunch of new taco shops open, which of these curves change? Supply. And which direction does it change? To the right. Right? That's an increase in supply. Tell me what happens to the market price now. It drops the market price. Okay, and price falls. Now price is falling. What does that do to the profits of all the taco shops? Now they're not making profit anymore, right? So then no, no new people enter. Okay, so the price keeps falling. On the flip side, if taco shops are not doing so well, right? What are some of the taco shop owners going to do? They're going to close up shop. What is the technical term for that? We call that exit, right? Exiting. They will exit. What does that do to the supply curve? It moves it to the left. It decreases supply, and that will bring the prices up, which will make the, the other guys OK. OK? So the price rises. And then the, the, the people who end up staying won't make a loss anymore. So basically, the idea is this. If firms are making a profit, what happens in the long run? More people join in and they push the price down till no one's making a profit. Okay? We call that the zero profit condition. In other words, in the long run, the long run equilibrium is when nobody's opening up new taco shops, nobody's leaving, and everybody's making zero profits exactly. Because if they were making profits, more people would join. If they were losing money, more people would exit. But if everyone's making zero profits, nobody's going to open up new shops or exit. No. So this only occurs when the price is equal to the ATC. Right? If I'm getting exactly as much as it costs me to make the product, that's, how, that's the only way I can, it can be that I'm making the zero profit. Okay. So uh, we know that firms produce where the marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and where price is, price is always equal to marginal revenue. That means that the zero profit condition is when the price is equal to the marginal cost, which is equal to the ATC. And don't forget, when marginal cost is equal to the ATC, where does marginal cost cross the ATC at? the very bottom point on the ATC, right? So that means when price is equal to the very bottom point on the ATC, then we're in long run equilibrium because nobody's making any profit. And the firms that are open are going to stay open. The firms that are closed are going to stay closed. Or the firms that are, yeah, nobody else is going to additionally is going to want to come into the marketplace is what that means. And that's what I just said, right? Marginal cost crosses ATC at the minimum point of the ATC. OK, so in the long run, price is equal to the minimum ATC.
All right, here's a good question, right? I just told you that in the long run, how much profit does everybody make? Zero dollars. Why on earth are firms staying in business if there's zero profit? Well, here's why. Economic profit is zero. Remember the difference between economic profit and accounting profit? Remember way back then? Right? Economic profit, you take the total revenue and you subtract all of the costs, including the implicit costs like the opportunity cost of the owner's time and money. Right? Economic profit is zero. So in the zero profit equilibrium, they're still making accounting profit, right? If you were to ask their accountant at the end of the day, yes, they're making more revenue that they're covering their costs to the accountant, right? But when I subtract off the opportunity costs also, then that's when they make zero, okay? They're making them zero. So accounting profit is positive. They're earning plenty of revenue to cover the, to, 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 oops, to cover the costs. It's only economic profit that's zero. Okay. So in other words, the firms might still be making, oh, I don't know, $60,000 a year, but like the owner, it's, cost, it's costing the owner $60,000 a year to be working in the taco shop and not working in another uh, building, uh, uh, industry. Does that make sense? That's what I mean by the zero profit condition. OK, questions on that? So here's the cool part. Here's what I'm going to show you now is how to get to the long run. In the, in the long run, so we have one firm on this side, and then we have the whole market as a whole. Okay? You, when we're talking about long run and short run changes, get used to putting these together, like right next to each other like this. right? The quantities are different. We put them like this because the quantities are different. But these prices, they're the same, right? It's $1, $2, $3, $4, $5, whatever, something like that, OK? So in the long run, the normal firm earns zero economic profit, which means that if you look at this thing here, it means the firm must be getting how many dollars for their product? Right here at the minimum ATC. The price must be there. Yeah, the price must be there. Uh, and that means that the long run market supply curve is horizontal at price equals the minimum average total cost. Meaning, in the long run, how much is the marketplace going to supply? They're going to supply as much as people want to buy, but the price is always going to be the same. So this is weird because most supply curves are upward sloping. This one's flat. Why is that? Well, if, more pe if it ends up that more people want to buy the product, it's just that more taco shops open up to supply the product, but everybody stays, the, the price will eventually go back down as low as possible. Right? So the story is a bunch more people come, they move to the town, a bunch more people want tacos, so the price spikes all of a sudden. But then a bunch more taco sellers come into town and provide more tacos. The price goes back down. And all that's happened is the quantity has increased. But in the long run, the price always stays the same. OK? That's the idea. So let's do the short run and the long run effects of an increase in demand. So this is, I think, one of the most interesting pieces of this chapter. And if you can learn how to do this, you've kind of gotten all the chapter all together. Okay? So let's think about what happens. We have one firm, the, the, excuse me, we have a bunch of firms, but we're just going to draw the supply and demand for one firm, and we're going to draw it for the whole marketplace. The quantities are different, but these prices are the same. That's why we put them right next to each other, just like this. Okay? Now, notice. The thing that looks like a supply curve when it's just one firm, we call it the marginal cost curve. But the thing that looks like a supply curve when it's for the whole marketplace, we call it the supply curve. Right? OK, we put it on there together. And cover this up. <laughs> Is this in long run equilibrium? Yes. How do you know it's in long run equilibrium? 
What do I know about the price at the long run equilibrium? It's got to be as low as possible. And that is as low as possible, yeah? So we know everything's good. And if we didn't touch this marketplace, nothing would happen, right? Basically, each, uh, the price is determined over here by the intersection of supply and demand, right? Q1 tacos are being sold, and they're being sold for P1 dollars a piece. Each individual firm is told, hey, you can sell your tacos for P1 dollars, and then they decide however much to make, right? It's a matter. Okay? But let's say that a bunch of people move into town, and I have an increase in demand for tacos, okay? What curve will change? A bunch of people come in town and they want more tacos. What curve is going to change? The market demand. Which direction will it change? To the right. So let's go ahead and move it to the right. What does that do to the market price? It increases the market price. You see that? Boom. Demand curve moved, the market price increased. So that's the whole marketplace. Now zoom in to just one firm. Imagine you're just one guy. Well, what does that mean? You all of a sudden, you're making tacos, and then the next day someone says, hey, you can sell tacos for more because there's a big increase in demand. So what are you going to do? You're going to sell them for more, and you're going to make more. OK? Does that make sense? Now look, that's how, notice the total number of tacos being eaten in society was Q1 and then it went to Q2, right? How did we put up with the increase in people who want to eat tacos? Well, every firm made more. Does that make sense? They used to make it here, and now they made more. And what's the other great thing for the firms? What are they doing now? You notice they're making a profit? Because price is not at the low at the bottom of ATC anymore, right? They're making a profit. How much are they making? Well, they get to sell for P2. Their costs is wherever it hits ATC, so they're making this rectangle right here of profit. So we have profits. Yay. But wait a second. Is it possible for perfectly competitive firms to earn profit in the long run? No. What happens? If the if the existing taco firms are making profits, what's going to happen? More taco firms are going to come in, right? OK. So we have a really short run. We're just talking about for maybe a couple of months or maybe a year here. OK? We're talking a very short run thing. In the long run, what will happen? More taco shops come into town. And now what will happen? What will happen in this graph if, uh, if more taco shops come into town? The supply will increase. Boom. Right there. And what does it do to the price now? It goes from A to B, but then the price does what? Goes back down. And we're at C. So you notice how the long run price can't ever actually change? The long run price never changes. In the short run, prices might go up and down. But in the long run, they always stay right here. And of course, the firm, on the firm side, the prices go back down. He doesn't make this profit anymore in the long run. He's back to zero profit, right? Drives profit to zero. And then once the price is back down here, once we're at point C, then we're at the long run equilibrium again. We're back. OK? So we started in the long run equilibrium. We had a momentary increase in price because of the demand. But then after like a year or something, then the prices came back down because more people opened up taco shops. All right? So notice the demand is much bigger. It used to be Q1, and now it's Q3. And the way we're making all those extra tacos is not the individual firms. They're still making as much as they were making in the beginning. But there's just a whole bunch more firms now that all came in. Okay? So this is called the transition to the long run. And you guys are going to need to know how to do this um, for the test. You guys are going to need to know, put the one firm next to the market uh, supply and demand curve. And then I'll give you something like, oh, 
more people, more people join. Or, I don't know, a tornado knocks down a bunch of taco shops, right? Or something like that. Or people decide that there's an outbreak of salmonella poisoning in taco shop tacos and everybody stops eating tacos, right? I'll tell you a story and you have to figure out what happens in the long run, okay? Well, in the short run is the first step, right? Because something first happens in the short run and then it happens in the long run, okay? So A to B is short run, B to C is long run. All right, so I, I told you the long run supply curve. In our models, is always flat, right? Long run supply curve is always flat. But in real life, it might slope slightly upwards. And let me just kind of explain to you why it might slope upwards in, in real life. So this assumption is it's horizontal if all firms have identical costs and costs do not change as other firms enter the market. If either of these is not true, then the long run supply curve might slope up slightly. OK? Um, and, and it's likely that in real life, the long run supply curve slopes up slightly because these are not exactly true. Why? Well, firms might have different costs. If you can imagine that if the market price for a good, if P is really low, the only people who are going to enter are like the firms that are really efficient, that can, to, can sell stuff for really low cost, that have really low costs. But then if like people keep want more and more wanting more tacos, then the people who are going to join are going to be people who are maybe higher cost firms. Okay. Um, so the firms might enter the market uh, later on, and that's the, the higher cost firms might enter the market later on, and that's one of the uh, breaks one of the assumptions. Firms have different costs, so the long run market supply curve might slope upward. At any price, though, the 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 zero profit condition still holds, right? The last guy to enter is making zero profit. Um, but for the, the lower cost firms, they might actually be making a profit. So the zero profit condition might not hold exactly if, if the firms have different cost structures. OK, and then number two, it might be true that costs rise as firms enter the market. So maybe the supply of a key input is limited, maybe farming, land, or maybe some natural resource. And so as more and more new firms comes in, it makes the costs for everybody go up, right? So all the firm's costs might be increasing. So that might make the long run supply curve um, increase to pay for this, this cost. OK, so in conclusion, the competitive markets Okay, the competitive marketplace is the most efficient marketplace, right? Uh, how do we find the profit max? This is always true for every firm. Marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Okay, uh, imperfect competition. This is true. Price equals marginal revenue. This is not always true, but this is true for perfect competition. So, in the in the competitive equilibrium, since price equals marginal cost is true for competitive firms, and marginal cost equals marginal revenue is always true then I know since both of these things are equal to marginal revenue, then I know that price must equal marginal cost, right? And so you know that. In the competitive firm, if I want to know how much product he makes, I just find whatever the market price is, I crash it into the marginal cost curve, and I find the quantity. That's what that's telling you right there. Price equals marginal cost. Wherever the price line is equal to the marginal cost line. Okay? All right. Um, and... What is marginal cost? Marginal cost is the cost of making one more unit. Price is how much people are willing to pay for one more unit. So at this point, at the point where price equals marginal cost, we're at a good point. The cost to society of producing one more good is exactly equal to how much society wants that good. So we're only making stuff that people want. So we have an efficient society, meaning that surplus is the maximum possible. OK? All right, so 
In the next chapter, we will move from competitive equilibrium and we will talk about the monopoly type of marketplace. All right, see you guys then.